Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show that I, your host, David Woodruff, lovingly call The Woodruff Report. I know I'm a day late with this podcast. Usually I record on Friday nights. Today I'm coming at you with a little special Saturday night podcast. And my reason being that I had a function to attend on Friday night. So I could not, I was not at home to podcast. But that doesn't matter because I'm with you here and I'm with you now. And we've got a ton of interesting content that we're going to hit you up with. Primarily being the Super Bowl. What a game. I'm just going to get it out of the way now. The best Super Bowl that I've ever seen, hands down. Better than the David Tyree catch. Better than the Malcolm Butler interception on the one-yard line. This had it all. This had the comeback. This had the great story of the quarterback, Tom Brady, cementing his status as the greatest of all time. And this had overtime, the first Super Bowl ever to be tied after regulation and have to go to overtime. I will also discuss overtime rules because they need a major makeover. That's coming at you later in the show. This is a football-only podcast. So my footballers, lo siento. My basketballistas, lo siento. But my football americanistas, it's your lucky day. We're coming at you with content. From football and the wide world of sports, I'm your host, David Woodruff. We're going to get started in three, two, one. Deflate this, Roger Goodell. The Patriots are Super Bowl champs after beating the Falcons of Atlanta 34 to 28 after overtime in NRG Stadium in Houston, Texas. Texas. What a game! As I touched on earlier in this podcast, it had it all. It had the big lead. It had the story of the of the already great quarterback rallying his troops coming back against all odds, literally against all odds. I was reading some articles about the Super Bowl. Midway through the third quarter when the game was 28-3 to in favor of Atlanta, the Patriots literally had a 0.3% chance of winning. One in 250. Can you believe that? But they came out on top and... For the fifth time in the Tom Brady era and Bill Belichick era, the Patriots are champions of the world. So, some stats from Tom Brady, because he had an absolutely incredible game. I'll kind of delve into what the stats mean, but first, let's just brush the surface, because the stats are incredible just standing by themselves. Tom Brady went 43 of 62 for 400 and 33 yards, and two touchdowns. He did have an interception that was returned for a touchdown, but he made amends for it, and in the end, he was clutch, which is something that we could not say about our friend Matt Ryan, his counterpart, the man out of Boston College. So I'm going to start talking about the Patriots because I don't really like to dwell I'd just like to get this out of the way now. The Falcons did not lose this game. There will be a lot of questions. Oh, did the Patriots win or did the Falcons lose? No, the Falcons didn't lose the game. They didn't throw it away. They just ran into a quarterback who is somehow still in the prime of his career, even though he's on the wrong side of 35 heading towards 40. He's still in the prime of his career. They ran into the blender that is the Patriots offense when it is clicking and their defense which, as I said before, needed to be opportunistic, couldn't come up with the stops when they needed it most. So a little get a little bit of game recap for you. The Falcons came out strong. There was no score after one quarter, but at halftime, the Falcons had put up a huge 21-3 to advantage. And I was scrolling through my Instagram feed after the game. This was well after the game. (laughs) And of course, I got to see all these videos of these Atlanta Falcons fans. Yeah, we won. Patriots, they got nothing on us. Of course, these were taken at halftime when the Falcons had that 
seemingly impenetrable lead up there. And just for all my fans out there, please, 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 please don't be the fan who records who records yourself saying that your team is going to win and talking about how the other team sucks when the game is still hung in the balance because you know you're just going to be the butt of jokes. Like the one I am making right now about the Falcon fans that were hating on New England at halftime when the game wasn't over and the greatest quarterback in the history of football still had another half to go at him. So anyway, as I was saying before, before I got on that sidetrack, Remember, don't be the fan before I got up on that sidetrack. 21-3 at halftime. Midway through the third quarter, the Falcons scored again, making it 28-3. And as I touched on earlier, this was the moment in the game when they had like a 0.3 chance of winning. Then the roaring Pats came back and just started to chip away. So James White was really the hero. He, had, he ended up having three touchdowns for the Patriots. But the Patriots didn't panic. As you can say so much in the Bill Belichick era, era, they didn't hang their heads. They just kept chipping away. They trusted the game plan. They trusted their QB. And they started to make plays. I mean, there were a lot of dropped passes by the New England receiving group. Edelman, Amendola, Hogan, and company. There were a lot of missed opportunities in the first half. And they started converting these opportunities, and that's when the turnaround happened. So they scored. Goskowski missed the extra point, making it 28-9. to And then that's when things really started kicking into high gear. New England took a long drive down the field and kicked a field goal to make it 28-12. to Then, as the Falcons got the ball back, um, Matt Ryan was strip-sacked, and Tom Brady was given a short field. He promptly went down and scored and converted the two-point attempt to make it 28-20. to On the ensuing drive, the Falcons were really moving the ball well. If you look back at the game, the Patriots really never had too much of an answer for Julio Jones and company. Devontae Freeman was running rampant, especially in the first half. Tevin Coleman had more of a quiet day, but Julio was his regular Julio self. What, what really, I think, killed the Falcons was that it, it's the Super Bowl, so I hesitate to say this, but I think they did lose a little bit of intensity. With that prolonged halftime that the Super Bowl has, because they needed to give that long performance to Lady Gaga, kudos to her, good performance, really liked the end where she caught the pass. Glad she didn't drop it. That would have been very embarrassing if she would dropped it. But they have that long halftime break, and you can really lose your intensity up, Everything was clicking for them in the first half. And it's, it's tough to say that they lost intensity, but they didn't come out as fired up as they were in the first half. So anyway, Atlanta was driving down the field, and they got it to around the Patriots' 20-25 yard line, courtesy of an incredible catch by Julio Jones, just a ballerina on the sideline, jumped up, Great throw by Matt Ryan, stepping up the pocket. Hucks like a 30-35 yard ball downfield. Julio gets it, points his toe like a ballerina, and gets both feet in. An absolutely incredible catch. Everyone was going nuts. And, of course, that catch is going to be overshadowed by another catch by Julian Edelman, which I will talk about later. But, incredible catch by Julio Jones. So, the Atlanta Falcons had the ball around the 20-25 yard line. Then... A lot of people are saying questionable play calling, but I think the execution wasn't just, just wasn't there. I think that the play calls were the correct ones. The passing game had been working, and so they continued to stick with it. They adhered to their game plan. But Matt Ryan was sacked for a big 10-plus 10 10 yards, more than 10-yard sack, and then a holding penalty moved him 10 more yards back, dropping the Falcons out of field goal range, forcing them to punt. And when you give it to Brady with a chance to go down the field with the game on the line, you are almost never going to come out on top. And that's what happened again. Brady led the Pats on a long drive, courtesy of an incredible juggling, leg swinging, arm bouncing, just barely not hitting Crazy catch by Julian Edelman. 
desperate kind of heave into triple coverage by Tom Brady. The ball was semi-tipped, bounced up in the air, three Atlanta players diving for it, Edelman kind of off balance, tipping it up to himself, barely catching it, and then letting go of it and catching it again. Obviously, you, you listen to me struggle to describe it. I really suggest going and looking at it because it was an absolutely incredible catch. But now the Pats are in business. They go down score, and then they get the two-point conversion. Danny Amendola makes the catch and just gets over the goal line with two Falcons trying to force him out. Great effort by Danny Amendola, who had himself a great game. It's always someone weird with these Patriots. Like, if you'd have gone into this game and said, oh, a, Pat- a Patriot running back is going to be the difference, and then asked me, And the Woodruff reports crystal ball. Who is the running back on New England going to be who makes the difference? My first guess would have been LeGarrette Blunt, the big bruising back. I would have been, oh, he must have just run rampant over this semi-weak Falcon defense. No, it wasn't LeGarrette Blunt. Oh, then it was probably Deion Lewis making making catches out of the backfield being shifty. Oh, it's not Deion Lewis. It's James White. He would have been my third guess. So the fact that he was the difference maker was really surprising. And the same thing with the wide receivers. Oh, uh, a New England wide receiver is going to be one of the big differences in this game. Edelman. Oh, Edelman had a good game, but it's not him. Uh, Hogan, he just had a great game in the AFC Championship game. No, he was pretty quiet. Amendola. So it's these third string play. It's not third string, but third fiddle guys, not even second fiddle. Third fiddle guys that Belichick and Tom Brady can make into great difference-making players, that's what makes the Patriots so good and threatening and why they're so good in the postseason. You can't zero in on one weapon. That's another thing that ended up hurting the Falcons. The Patriots kind of zeroed in on their weapon. And although they were able to move the ball after the second-half adjustments, their offense was much more stagnant than they were in the first half. So Patriots tie it up, and we're going to overtime. New England wins the toss and elects to take the ball, knowing that if they score their win, there was never any doubt. Tom Brady and company march down the field, and James White, on a toss play, gets into the end zone. The crowd goes nuts. The players go nuts. Everyone's going nuts. I'm slamming my pillow down in disgust in my living room because I was tired of the Patriots winning. I respect the legacy, but I I really wanted the Falcons to win this game. A little bit of Woodruff report bias here. I picked the Falcons to win this to win this game, so that's another reason why I wanted them to win. But I slam my pillow down in the in disgust. Half the NRG crowd is going crazy. The other half is absolutely despondent. Matt Ryan and that high-powered offense ended up just having to sit on the sideline and watch the GOAT, the greatest of all time, Tom Brady, march down the field and score. So That's a little game recap, 34-28 in OT. Patriots are your Super Bowl champs. Congratulations, New England. You deserved it. Great season. I mean, the coaching that they had this year was tremendous. To have Tom Brady out the first four games for Deflategate and still to be able to put up this great season and end up with another Lombardi trophy. It's just amazing the dynasty that they've done, especially in this era where parody is the name of the game in the NFL. They don't want any greats. They want a very evenly matched league. Congratulations again. So just before I wrap up this episode, I really wanted to talk about overtime rules because it's really time, it's time to make a change. This whole thing where it ends up really being a coin toss is just a little bit ridiculous in my mind. Now, Don't mistake what I'm saying now. I'm not complaining about what happens. I'm not like, it's not like the whole electoral college thing. Oh, Trump won? Well, the electoral college is stupid. Oh, the Patriots won? Well, overtime is stupid. I'm not saying that. I'm just, from a completely objective point of view, the overtime really needs to be changed. And I don't think it would be that difficult. I think they just need to change it to what what the college game uses. The college game... One team starts on the 25-yard line, and it's just regular football. They go down and score, and then they can either kick kick an extra point or go for two until triple overtime. In triple overtime, they are mandated to go for two. And the other team must 
whatever score they get. So if they score and t- get the two-point conversion, the other team gets the ball on their 25-yard line, and they have to go score and then get the two-point conversion. But this whole thing where if the one team gets the ball and goes down and scores, the game's over, but if they kick a field goal, the other team has a shot, and it's 15 minutes and the game can end in a tie, oh, come on. I mean, it. it I... As I'm sitting here explaining it, I'm saying, wow, this is stupid. It's time for a change. So the NFL should really just use the college rules. I think it would be, it'd be very interesting. I love college overtimes personally, and I think a lot of other people do too. The college overtime rules haven't really been changed much because they are effective and they work, and they don't make the outcome of a game incumbent upon a coin a coin flip, which frequently happens in the NFL. Oh, it ends up being like, if you win the game because you called heads and it was heads. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's not how a football game should end. A football game should end because one team exerts their dominance or um, attacks an opposing team's weakness until they eventually are victorious. So I'm not complaining about the overtime rules and how the Patriots won in overtime, but it's really time for a change, is what I'm trying to say. So before we leave, I just want to touch on the Atlanta Falcons. Congratulations on a great season. No one saw them coming. I talked about this a little bit on a previous show, um, that more people had bet on the Browns to win the Super Bowl than the Atlanta Falcons. But this really put Matt Ryan, if, he w- if there ever was a question of if he's elite, an elite quarterback or not, he's definitely in that top echelon now. This team looks dangerous moving forward. They've got young pieces in place. They will have to make a decision about Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman in terms of who are they going to pay because both can make the argument that they, are, they deserve to be top number one backs in terms of paycheck and in terms of Uh, numbers of carries per game but they're young that defense is only going to get better and so yeah bright future ahead so I would not be too sad Atlanta fans you were not really expected to win the Super Bowl this year so this was really kind of a bonus year and I think moving forward you will be a favorite Kyle Shanahan the offensive coordinator on the Atlanta Falcons is moving on to your boy the San Francisco 49ers Good hire by them. I feel bad for Kyle Shanahan because he's walking into the greatest disaster in all of sports, which is the San Francisco, or should I say Santa Clara 49ers. He's walking into that that burning hot dumpster fire. But it'll be interesting who they hire because that offense is young, it's creative, it's high-powered, and whoever they put in charge of it will put their own little flair on it. And if they get a really good coach in there, I personally want to see Chip Kelly. I think that'd be kind of interesting, have Chip Kelly run that offense. Chip Kelly and Julio Jones, ooh-wee. What a pairing that would be. But it'll be interesting to see how that offense evolves without Kyle Shanahan. The best of luck to Kyle Shanahan. You will need it in San Francisco. I, 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 I said I would boycott all the games until Jed York left. But I think the 49ers have done enough that they are deserving of my viewing this year. They fired their GM. They fired their head coach. There's hope as long as they don't take a quarterback with the number two pick. If they pick Deshaun Kaiser or Mitch Trubisky, I will continue my ban on watching the 49ers. But what am I doing? I'm talking about the 49ers when this was a Super Bowl podcast. So just to wrap up on this show, I talked about your... Super Bowl 51 champs, the New England Patriots, and the incredible game that they were a part of between them at the Atlanta Falcons. I also talked about a little bit of tinkering that the NFL should do with their overtime rules. And then I got off on a side tangent and talked about the 49ers. How did the 49ers sneak into a conversation about elite football teams? Who knows? Anyway... I'm your host, David Woodruff. I hope I didn't make your day too much worse by referencing the 49ers. Okay, I'll stop. I promise. I'll stop. I'll stop talking about the 49ers. I'm your host, David Woodruff. This was the Woodruff Report. I'm sorry that I didn't record Friday night, 
but I had a function, as I said previously in the show. This is your first ever Saturday edition of the Woodruff Report extra special episode. So thank you to all those part of the Woodruff Report. We'll see you on Friday of next week, normal schedule. Again, I'm your host, David Woodruff. Thanks for listening. This is the Woodruff Report. Have a good night.